Uh, we have our final panel of the day. It's going to be on a very cool topic, uh, investing in the digital world, you know, new approaches to venture capital. And we have a great lineup for you guys as well. We have Neeraj Punt from Polychain Capital. We have Melton Demirs from uh, CoinShares. And we have Ash Egan from Accomplice Venture Capital. And the panel itself is going to be moderated by Amanda Fabiano from the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. So I think the uh, panel is going to be walking right in. So let's just give it a minute or two, and we'll be good to go. So uh, thank you, Hugo, and the rest of the Bitcoin Expo committee for having us today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I know we said intros. My name's Amanda. I work at Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. I am not a VC. So if anyone sent me messages about investing in your company, I cannot do that. Um, so I wanted to do a quick intro of everyone. But I want to kind of switch it up a little bit. Can you tell me what is the worst pitch that you have heard as you introduce yourself? You don't have to give names of companies or people, unless you want to get really bold. Oh, I'll have to think about yeah. it. Um, can you come back to me? Sure. Uh, I, I, I can have some. <laughs> oh, five years of this shit. It's great. Um, so, hi, my name is Meltem Demirers. Um, I run strategy for a company called CoinShares, meaning that I build investment products. We build both retail and institutional products. Before that, I was at Digital Currency Group, where we invested in 120 companies in the three years I was there. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and before that, I was here at MIT in grad school. So great to be back. And massive congrats to the MIT Bitcoin Club for putting on an amazing expo. <laughs> Woo! Very, very uh, much larger than the first one they had in 2015. So the worst pitch I heard, um, I just got today, it's for private jet coin, where, mm, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yes. So it's a coin uh, where you can document your private jet travel. I don't really understand what it is, but it's amazing to me that people are still trying to do ICO scams in 2019. Yes. Amazing. Yes, totally. Ash? Cool. Um, I'm Ash Egan. I'm with the firm here in Boston called Accomplice. We also have an office out west where I'm based. I've been investing in this space since 2015, roughly when I met Meltem. Um, we are, so we're a $200 million fund, a generalist fund. I focus on blockchain and crypto. Um, uh, we're announcing a bunch of our portfolio companies within crypto in the next coming, in the coming weeks or so. Uh, in terms of worst pitches, so before Accomplice, I was at Consensus Ventures in the, uh, in the hype cycle when, you know, everyone was raising, I think it wasn't just one project. I feel like there was dozens or so that um, were pitching some type of crazy idea and they were already, um, you know, alluding towards that they were going to be listening exchanges. They already had telegram groups who were ready to pump the coin and all these things. And that was like a theme across dozens or so of projects. So I don't know if I can point to one in particular. All right, must be the bear market, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Naraj? Hi, my name is Naraj, and I'm with uh, Polychain. Um, we are a 22 person firm out in San Francisco, uh, focused primarily on crypto. Um, as for, for best or a worst pitch, I would say we had a company come in raising for five different vehicles. They're raising for a, like a fund, a company, another company, like five different vehicles to invest in, and we had a day to invest in it. They're like, you have to decide today, otherwise you're, you're out. So that was probably the worst pitch we've ever seen. Did you invest? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So Wait, did, did I tell you about my fund? <laughs> today only. <laughs> So you've obviously seen a lot of different companies, um, but how does a founder run a, a really good company from your perspective? What characteristics does a good founder have? I, I think um, right now in the crypto market, it's really interesting to see, um, like when I started, it was really just about Bitcoin. And then we went through the enterprise blockchain stage where many of the Bitcoin companies pivoted to enterprise blockchain. And then when Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies more broadly became a thing again in late 2017, they tried to pivot back to crypto. And then it's very difficult to raise money once you go through so many pivots. Um, it's I think it's just really difficult to 
keep pivoting, shifting as the tide shifts. So I think really being focused and knowing what problem you're trying to solve. If you want to go solve a Wall Street problem, go solve a Wall Street problem. If you want to build privacy enabling tools, build that. I think a lot of people, um, they get excited about where the market's moving and they don't stay focused. And I think you can tell when you speak with a founder whether they're focused or not. Like one of my um, investments personally is in Casa. So that company is all about privacy and self-sovereignty and that team focuses on just that 100%. So to me, having a team that, yes, can flex and adapt, but is very strongly focused on their core mission is critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the, the way I think around it is, I think it's like running a protocol and you know uh, your own native blockchain versus running a company that's enabling crypto are two very different pieces. Like uh, my first investment in the space was in a company called Chainalysis. Like those guys are growing like a traditional SaaS type company. Sure, they're um, building within the crypto sphere, but you know that's uh, they're going to be judged off this off similar fundamentals that you know a traditional venture capital company would would raise on. On the protocol side, I think it's you know community, um, ensuring that you have enough cash, um, you know having bounties. There's uh, you know, being cognizant of miners or stakers if it's proof of stake. So I think there's a lot of various complexities on the on the protocol side. Um, but I, I'd look at them in, in two very different buckets. Uh, both really great answers so far. And I think a couple things I'd like to add is I think drive, kind of like drive and vision towards the product is really important. I see this a lot with crypto companies is that uh, founders will get really, really excited about the technology uh, and get really into the problem, but never really see if, you know, if it's useful or, or it'll kind of drive the actual vision of the company. So it's really important to kind of recenter yourself and make sure that, you know, the company is doing what it's. The company is building the products it you know needs to be building. Yeah, that's that um, is super interesting because I was going to ask you. So you guys evaluate companies, but how do you evaluate it from a technical perspective? So we have a uh, we have kind of a couple ways to look at it. I think if you're looking at it from a, a highly technical product, whether it's a layer two project, layer one project. Um, we have a couple of people on the team that have backgrounds in this and are really knowledgeable about it. Um, so I think it just takes a lot of looking at these projects over time, looking at you know research projects, coming to conferences like this and understanding the tech really well uh, to really understand if something is technically interesting. Uh -huh. I actually take a very different approach. I don't think it's about the tech at all. I've worked with hundreds of founders at this point all in the crypto space. And if you can't explain something to me like I'm five years old and help me understand what it is you're doing with the technology and why I should care about it, that's not going to work. And I see a lot of technical complexity theater in the crypto space where people will come in, they won't do their homework about who you are as an investor, they'll sit in a room, they'll basically give you word soup, and you try to untangle what it is they're saying. They can't even explain to you what they're saying in a cogent way. That to me is an instant red flag because it doesn't matter how advanced your technology is. It's like people going around and marketing how fast their blockchain is. This was a big theme last year. People were like, oh, we can do 5 million transactions per second. I'm like, great, but for what? What is the point of that? And so I think there is a lot of um, unnecessary complexity that goes on. Um, there are people who try to obfuscate what they're doing and their inability to really find a market for it by speaking very technically. And so to me, it's much more about um, once you get to a point where you're convinced of the vision, you're convinced the product actually has a use case and an end market, and that you can actually deliver the product. A lot of people are trying to build things that will need like five or 10 years from now, not right now. Um, then at that point, that's where I start to dig into the technology. And that's where you leverage a network of other founders you work with in your portfolio, other people but the technology to me is kind of a second order concern because there are so many people who are technically very gifted but just fail to understand how to build community, how to educate, and how to take what they're doing and make it relevant to the people who are actually going to end up using the tools, which we see a lot. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, I mean, look, there's innovations in this space and cryptography and distributed systems every day. Like, um, and I think the folks who can successfully implement, you know, Starks and Snarks, um, these are existing protocols and, and companies. And 
sure you're going to see new uh, companies that rise out of this out of this research, but um, I think folks that can effectively market that, message that, and build meaningful product are going to be the um, you know the massive winners in the space. Mm -hmm. So Meltem, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but we we've seen a change in the space, right? We saw this whole narrative that ICOs were going to take over VCs, right? And we've kind of shifted from that. So what? How has your strategy shifted over the years? Um, and you know, how do you keep up with the rapid pace of the industry? Sure. So I feel like uh, things in crypto have moved really quick, quickly, but at the same time, not at all, because we're still solving problems that we had five, six <laughs> years ago, right? Like exchanges got hacked then, they're still getting hacked now. Um, so I feel like in a way, um, for all of the innovation that we have, some things are moving more slowly than we think they will, because there is a natural diffusion rate at which these things can diffuse into the broader user base. And I think in crypto, sometimes we get into these little echo chambers. So you the most critical thing for me has been um, stepping outside of the echo chamber and really thinking about, okay, well, how is this relevant, right? The audience isn't just the people in this room. The audience is every person in the world, or it's every enterprise in the world, or every financial institution in the world. Um, so my strategy has always been, whether at a firm or with my personal investing, is does it make sense to me? And again, 90% of the stuff I hear doesn't make sense to me. And by no means am I the best barometer. Um, by no means am I the most clever individual. But if someone can't make sense of their company to me, then it's just probably not going to make sense generally. So I think a lot of ICOs, um, a lot of the themes we saw around enterprise blockchain, I was like, I don't really know what this is or what to do with it or where it fits in. So I think there's a lot of intuition that goes into it and really just understanding, well, based on what I know about the world and based on how I view the world, which is much bigger than the, just this room here, um, does this make sense? Do I think there is someone who would pay for this? And if the answer is no, I think that's really challenging. So a lot of what we're seeing now, which is, you know, we went through enterprise blockchain, then we went to ICOs. I uh, made a shirt that said venture capital is dead, and I wore that around. That was fun. <laughs> but look, uh, venture is not going anywhere. I think now the question is, are ICOs the right fundraising model? Probably not. So you just have to stay very flexible. I've made plenty of mistakes. Um, I've learned from those mistakes. I hope. Uh, and so you just keep evolving your mental model and adjusting it as you learn what works and doesn't. But your intuition is always the best guide. I don't know what you guys think. But. Yeah, I mean, for us, with with seeing the evolution of, of financing in crypto, even the last two years, it's gone from, you know, I see, you know, public public sales to SAFs to SAFs with equity conversions. Um, ICOs are kind of in a trough of disillusionment, but I actually think they were a really great innovation, and we'll we'll see like better versions of them in the in the coming years. Um, when we think about you know proof of stake networks, for example, um, when you when you look at traditional equity, you kind of try to keep the number of investors on a cap table really low, because it's easier with IR and easier with uh, general management. But with something like a proof of stake network, you really want to grow the number of people on the cap table. It keeps it, you know, it's more decentralized or, you know, more number of holders. And so ICOs are a great distribution mechanism, but it's kind of in a kind of in a weird phase where a lot of capital was raised, not a ton was created, but I think something will emerge out of the ashes eventually. So uh, before I was entirely focused on blockchain crypto investing, I was a generalist VC. I felt like, you know, I'd, I'd dig into a space, spend, let's say, six weeks or so, and I'd come up with a thesis, and um, that would, if I was right, that would hold true for X amount of years. If I was wrong, you know, you, you quickly figure out you're wrong. Um, with crypto and, and blockchain, you know, it's um, it's very different. I feel like every eight weeks or so, I'm I'm uh, revisiting my theses, testing my assumptions. Um, you know, I think a great example of that is uh, you know Uniswap came out of nowhere, and uh, the the founder of Uniswap, he's a you know 21 year old or so. He sort of uh, with, knew Carl or uh, knew knew a few folks at um, Ethereum and Consensus, and sort of just like spun this thing up, and all of a sudden you see the you know, the fastest growing DEX um, in the world. It's, you know, sort of um, similar type growth as, as Maker in its first 100 or so days. And so I feel like it's uh, constantly evolving. And um, I think that's a great embodiment of, of crypto, even, even though we are in a, so, a so-called bear market. Yeah, that's actually my next question. What is uh, investing like in the bear market? Are you seeing downturns? What do you, what do you say? What bear market? 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, there, there's not a bear market. Uh, valuations are still crazy high. People's expectations of what valuation they should raise at is still just absolutely obscene. Um, I don't think there is a bear market. Look, we're at this conference. The room is full. Like people are still flying around the world. People still are spending money. Like it's not a bear market. So I don't really see it. Yeah, if you compare now to maybe 2015, the, the last bubble, it really felt dead, like that that time period. But now it feels like there's a large ecosystem of companies. Um, I remember when I was looking for a job, you know, four or five years ago, there wasn't really a lot of crypto companies to go work at. There was maybe five or six. And now if I wanted to go work at a company today, there's at least 10 to 20 that I'd be really interested in working at. So I think that's a really uh, great shift. You know, for, in terms of deals and stuff we're funding, it's obviously slower, but this is also a really good time to double down on exciting investments and find more unique opportunities that wouldn't typically come about in a, in a bull market. Agreed. <laughs> Fair. Um, so what are some advice for VCs in the audience? Uh, I'm sure there's some out there, right? So how do you balance inbound? How do you be a really good VC in crypto? Don't sleep. <laughs> yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> um, I think the, the biggest thing for me has been, like, use every product. I'm amazed, um, you know, working with other firms, investing, just working in the space as an investor for the last five years in a fairly visible way. Like, people I would talk to had never used the products they were investing in, and that's shocking to me, right? So you're going to put $5 million into a company if you've never used the product. You've never used your own wallet. Like, you hold all your Bitcoin on Coinbase. Shame on you. That's really embarrassing. So I think a big thing if you're investing in this space is to actually try these tools and see how they work and to force yourself to learn. So a great example is Gotenna, right? I'm not an investor in Gotenna. I have no affiliation with it, but I was really interested in um, improving the resiliency of crypto and thinking about ways to use cryptocurrencies in environments where infrastructure might be deprecated. So like, hey, I'm going to organize a meetup. I'm going to invite the Gotenna people I know. I'm going to buy a bunch of these things. And I'm going to sit in a room with a bunch of people. And we're going to learn how to use them and how they work. And I ended up, as a result of that meetup, writing a 10-page spec and <laughs> sending it back to the Gotenna engineers and the Samurai Wallet engineers and being like, hey, here are all the things that didn't work for us. But I think it's really, really important to participate, and especially with proof-of-stake networks now is becoming even more important. I run a delegation service in Tezos, for example. I own Tezos personally. Like, you have to get involved and try these things, or else you're never going to be able to develop uh, a perspective that makes sense. And I just get very concerned when I see people who are like, yeah, I'm investing in space. I'm like, right, but have you ever used this thing you're invested in or that you talk about? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, that, that's a problem, yeah. I think. I don't know. That's my view. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, I uh, most of my job, I, I talk to other crypto VCs, but I'm trying to spend more time talking to traditional VCs, you know, institutional allocators, and understand like how different the, the narrative is and what it'll take to kind of bridge the two. Um, and in terms of companies, like Meltem said, like you just kind of have to be online all the time. Like you have to be on it, seeing what's happening, because the space moves really, really quickly. Looking at stuff from even January to March, there's already been new projects launching with a, a a ton of users or a ton of ton of funds locked in or whatever metric you want to use. So you just kind of have to be kind of be on top of it. Yeah, I think both great answers. Um, one other thing I'd, I'd add, just coming from a fund which is focused on a number of different industries and sectors, is just setting expectations, right? Um, I'd, I'd say it's different if, if you're investing in protocols, right? Um, adoption and um, metrics are very different than, you know, your typical SaaS or enterprise software type startup. So I think... Um, a large part of, uh, you know, the, the folks who are, uh, you know, sort of in charge of leading blockchain or crypto research or investments at, you know, generalist funds, um, I think it's important to educate um, and set expectations for, for the team because um, these, for the at least for the protocol side um, and crypto native applications and whatnot, these are, you know, they, they just look very different than, you know, your typical startup. Yeah, so how do you actually value crypto assets? Like, how do you, how do you value crypto into assets? Yeah, I think we're, look, I think we're still very early in experimenting um, with 
various models. Uh, Chris Berniski has done some awesome work. There are a variety of other folks, you know, um, that, have, have, that have done solid work there. I think the reality is that there's no, for at least when these companies are fundraising, there's no one vanilla way they fundraise, right? Some are raising equity, some are doing SAF, some are doing SAFDs, some are, um, you know, uh, 2017 it was buying tokens directly. And so I think um, we're still figuring out, you know, a number of different ways to experiment how to value these things. We, uh, as a fund, we do not buy off exchanges or when these uh, tokens or coins are, are publicly list and whatnot. So, I mean, look, we look at it from a early stage, long-term capital perspective. Um, I think, you know, to, to your guys' point earlier, the, the, the markets are definitely, uh, you know, it still doesn't feel like we're in a total bear market. I mean, there are a lot of folks that went out trying to raise at a billion dollar valuation that were pre-product. Maybe they've come down to a hundred million or so, yeah. um, which is- Which is crazy. still too high. Yeah, which is Way too crazy. high. Yeah. Um, I, I think looking within tokens, it's also important to classify the type of token valuation you're looking at. Uh, the nice thing about private token sales is that they, you have a, a basis in the public market. You know, if you come to me with a $2 billion valuation smart contract system and, and everything is trading at $300 million, it kind of just doesn't match up. Um, but there's other types of tokens, I think, that have interesting models. Uh, Bitcoin's a little bit different. Uh, uh, Charlie Munger once said that nothing intelligent can be said about the price of gold. And I think in some cases, it may be true of Bitcoin right now. But there's, there's some really cool uh, modeling happening right now. A lot of great research happening. Uh, things like Maker, people have done, done DCF models. And so I'm just excited to see future valuation models, but it doesn't feel like it's quite falling in line with, say, like an equities market. But I, I think that's also not um, the point. I think one of the interesting things to me is everyone's trying to copy the success of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And this is all about patterns. And so the fundraising pattern for the last two years has been, oh, we're the next Bitcoin, oh, we're the next Ethereum. And the thing is, um, in investing, most of the things that do well are exceptions. Right, there's the rules, but the things you have to find are the exceptions. And so if someone comes to you and it's the exact same pitch over and over again, and if it's within the same blueprint, it's probably not going to be an exception. So you have to look for things that are unique or that I look for things that scare me as an investor. Like some people will tell me an idea, I'm like, that's real, real fucking crazy. But I'm in, that's that, that feels right. Um, but you have to size it the right way. I think that's the other piece that people forget about is it's also about looking at your portfolio and aggregate and also having the right allocation strategy depending on what you're trying to do. If this is short term for you, right? A lot of people flip tokens. That was basically the token fund model for a long time. If that's what you're doing, that's a short term model. Some people have bought five to 10% stakes in networks and now are participating in governance in these networks, trying to shape outcomes. That's more of an activist investing strategy. So I think you have to be very specific about what your strategy is, what your competence is as an investor, and scale and size accordingly. And I feel like most people lack that nuance. So. So that covers tokens, but what about like uh, infrastructure companies that are building right now? So is there a concern for rev revenue growth ever in those companies? So how do you separate, you might be super interested in a company and you really like it, but maybe it's not the best investment. Like how do you separate like your heart from your head in investing? Well, fidelity coming into the space is certainly scary for many infrastructure <laughs> companies, right? Um, I think there it goes back to, um, look, the venture model is not for every idea. And I think that's another real limitation. It's like venture capital is not the model for every investment opportunity. But I think with the infrastructure side, it's really about, well, the business model right now, the only business model that's been working is speculation. So the businesses that make money are exchanges and platforms that enable speculative trading. And so right now that's like the primary use case and we're starting to move into utilization. So maybe there's some payments, payments processing. Arguably those businesses have made money because the price of the assets they hold have gone up, not because they're getting massive transaction fees. So the question is, what is the business model outside of speculation? And I'm not really convinced that there are clear business models outside of speculation or custody, which is a part of the speculative cycle in this moment in time. I'm not convinced. Ash, what do you think? Yeah, I th look, I think um, when you think around crypto, uh, you know, Bitcoin, what, 10 years old or so, I think, though, um, you know, it was really Ethereum that led to sort of thinking around crypto as software. Um, and we're really just in the first inning of 
what's uh, what's possible, experimentation, um, you know, getting uh, enough smart folks in the space. Like, it was incredible seeing, you know, ERC-721, CryptoKitties leading to, um, you know, just like an absolutely massive audience. It might have been driven by speculation. Um, I'm fine if that's going to be the Kickstarter to get uh, more folks listening and, and thinking around these these pieces, but um, look, I, th I think we're still in the early days. Um, a lot of the boring companies, analytics, you know, these various other pieces, sort of like uh, we're seeing a rise of staking as a service companies or infrastructure plays. I think um, those will be a, another fascinating uh, category to watch. Oracle services, decentralized oracles. Um, you know, I think there are a variety of, of ancillary pieces to the rise of Bitcoin and, and other protocols that will be slow and steady. Um, but I think we're still figuring out what the killer applications are. And I, I agree. I think speculation has been a, you know, a big driver of that in, in the recent years. Yeah, I think re lack of revenue is not lack of trying. Like Companies are obviously trying. It's just really hard to fit what construct makes the most sense. Um, there, like One trend in the smart contract system side of thing is a lot of companies that build financial infrastructure, there's this common problem that it's really hard to extract revenue. Um, and so a lot of companies are moving in this trend of, of building full stack or building vertically. Um, we've seen this with almost every team in the space where they build a financial infrastructure on the bottom, whether that's lending or a stable coin, uh, but they also build the sort of user interface on top and they build ways to ex extract revenue, whether, whether through fees or through kickbacks of some sort. I, I mean, the traditional finance industry works like this. They take 25, 50 basis points uh, type <laughs> revenue from... In crypto, from we do 250, though. <laughs> we multiply it by 10. <laughs> that's the model. <laughs> that, that's, the way to, that's the way to moon. But, but I, like, let's be very realistic. Um, for all of the talk, like, what got me into Bitcoin wasn't building another Wall Street, building another financial system. That is exactly what we're doing. And that is so sad to me and so disappointing. I am not excited about building the next bank or selling a company to Goldman Sachs. That is not the point. If that's the point, like, why even work in crypto at all? I'm sorry, but it's not. And the things that we as a community are most excited about are making crypto centralized and putting it into centralized repositories. 17% of all crypto, to a Bitcoin pardon today, is in custody with a third party custodian. How is that self-sovereign money? It's the antithesis. So a lot of what we're doing, because there is no business model, is going back to the same shit we've been doing for the last 30 years. And so I really think that this space, I'm, I want to see more creativity in how people approach these problems. But there, like, there has to be a, a line you draw where you separate your values from what makes money. And the problem is, if you're an investor, you're a fiduciary. Right? You're responsible for making money for people who invest with you. That's why I invest my own money, because I can do whatever I want. Um, but I think this is a big problem, and that's a problem you see in traditional VC. Like the incentives are fundamentally misaligned. Mm -hmm. So you're a personal investor, but um, Ash and Raj, you might be working with people like LPs in the room. So how do you ex how do you like explain what goes on in crypto world to like the adults in the room? Right, so like for example, like uh, the lightning torch, right? It was awesome. It was created by an internet cat and given to someone named Fartface2000. And so like, <laughs> for example, like Fidelity took the torch at one point, right? But like having that conversation with the adults in the room can be difficult. So like, how do you have the conversation of like, what's going on in the crypto world with those like LPs and? Yeah, I think um, I've, my experience was, I've, I try to stay away from the nuances and the terminology of crypto land. Okay. Um, my experience was I was talking about a company. I mentioned sharding. Our yeah. CFO laughed at it. You know, everyone in the room started laughing. And so, yeah, like, no, you, know, it's real. you know, he brought up Ben Stiller, <laughs> you know, like wh whatever movie, movie it was that, that coined sharding. Um, so, yeah, I think, look, I, I try to speak in generalities about these things and, and try to, you know, describe um, some of the things I'm seeing, sort of, you know, the macro movements and whatnot. But going into the nuances, talking about Mimble Wimble, Harry Potter, all these things is just, um, you know, I think institutional LPs, that's uh, not something that they're, mm -hmm. they're not going to, you know, be reading these white papers or anything. Mm -hmm. There's like a pretty wide gap between what is Bitcoin and you know passing around the lightning torch. For I think LPs have a really actually strong understanding of how to allocate capital. 
when they're investing into crypto, they're like, should we invest in a hedge fund to invest in new tokens? Should we invest in a venture capital fund, a longer vehicle? They understand where this space plays, and they're trying to understand how aggressively they want to pursue it. Um, and so when having these conversations, you explain it to some degree, but it's really our job to just bring returns. And it's we're, we're kind of the experts here. And yeah, we, we, we kind of have to do the job of actually figuring out if this is interesting or not. They, we, you know, you explain Bitcoin, you can compare it to certain Wall Street constructs or, you know, new types of money, but it only goes so far before you kind of have to fill the, fill the rest of the gap. But it is self-selecting. Like, our investors, they know who I am. I, there is no confusion about where I stand. And so um, it's also important, um, like, people choose you as the manager, right? People who invest with me, they trust my judgment. And so it's also about being very clear um, as to where you stand on these issues and being very clear with your investors, like, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. This is what I believe in as a person and as the person who is investing on your behalf. And if you are not in alignment with that, you are not going to have an, a good experience. So it's really, it's a two-way match, right? It's not just about us attracting institutional capital. It's also about finding investors who are on board with your vision and who share the same values, the same perspective on where the market's going, which I think many institutional investors actually do. Um, are we out of time? I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, All right. Uh, Sounds good. But we could entertain just one or two quick questions because okay. the panel was fantastic. So first, could we just get a round of applause for the panel? <laughs> All right. So we'll do like one or two very quick questions. Um, you mentioned uh, Crypto Kitties. And um, I was wondering if uh, any of you have uh, an informed uh, opinion about the crypto art as a, as a sub niche. Yeah, I think there's a lot of great work happening around digital art and digital collectibles. Um, I think uh, this year at Art Basel, there was a lot of talk about um, different art collectors as well as galleries looking at ways to use um, tokenization uh, to create digitally scarce art. Actually, if anyone remembers Rare Pepe's, does anyone remember Rare nice. Pepe's? Yeah, that was like the first real mainstream popular digital. <laughs> no, okay. Um, maybe just for weirdos like myself. But I think there are a lot of experiments happening, right? Um, I think the key question is without infrastructure where people who aren't crypto people can manage private keys without some of the UX components, it's really difficult. I don't know if other people have thoughts, but I think um, there, it's very niche still because the infrastructure to help people manage private public key infrastructure, to help people manage wallets just really isn't there yet. And I think the business model is still a little iffy. And Go. Uh, I think uh, with investing, like we, we get a lot of NFT pitches. Uh, with investing in this space, sometimes it's not really like investing in a product or a layer one, but almost like investing in art. I think it's kind of a fundamentally different uh, type of investing. I know in, in uh, traditional investing, there are actually like hedge funds that trade art. And I think I'd love to see like a crypto fund that traded NFTs, and not, maybe not in the next year, but you know, hopefully in five years. Yeah. All know. right, uh, so yeah, one more. Uh, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also still own Beanie Babies. So does Fred Wills. I mean, go for it. Go for it while I'm walking. So speaking Fred Wills. From the allocator, for example, of a pension, of a pension or a family office, how might one decide to invest in uh, a crypto VC? Because respectively, you guys have some track records compared to you know, everyone on Sandra Road. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, look, if you look at the world that investors think about, crypto is like 1% of their time, right? Um, and so until it becomes to 5, 10% of what they do, right now their primary concern is the equities market. Right? Look at what's happening, turmoil in the equities market. This is such a small percent of their exposure. They're really just looking to get access. And it's, I think the returns are important, yes, but a lot of it's also about connecting with someone smart who gives them access and perspective as to the things that are happening in crypto. They're not going to sit on Twitter for 20 hours a day like a crypto VC. Um, so I think a lot of it is like distilling information and getting 
edge inside information for people who are living it. So over time, I think we see funds like Vision Hill. They've created a performance tracker where they're comparing quarterly performance of funds. They're trying to segment by strategy, which I think is a starting point. But I think a lot of the funds themselves are also pivoting strategies, right? They went from token investing to now more VC style investing. We're seeing activist funds emerge. We saw the first uh, short moral driven activist funds, kind of like a Carson uh, Block Muddy Waters type model. So as the market matures, you'll see more strategies and styles evolve and more information start to evolve around what performance should be. But I think a lot of it's really just very early and uh, very experimental, frankly. Uh, I, I would agree with that. And, and just to add to that, I think when allocating, choosing between someone with a track record that hasn't done any crypto versus someone that really understands the space, to me, the, the answer is more obvious. Um, you know, with us, you know, we have a, a bunch of ex-Coinbase employees. That company has, you know, generates a lot of revenue every year. Uh, and so there has been some history. It's just not very long, and it's, it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. But when looking into emerging markets, I always follow the experts because they know the industry the best. And uh, it's kind of hard for incumbents to really, I think, grasp new things as, as easily. All right. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 last question, last question. Yeah. Last question. So what blockchain has gotten people excited about investing in open source development, but Linux started in 1991. So that's like a long time ago. So when are we going to see blockchain be like epic? in like 30 years from now, will VC still have money? Isn't that a conflict of interest? Isn't that the, that's just, this conference, that. right? The next 10 years, so we'll see oh, maybe in the next years. 10 years. 30 years? 30 30 years. years. <laughs> I hope I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, we'll have to wrap it there, but one more round of applause for these guys.